Right. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for those who are very prompt and have already joined. I'm just going to give people about 30 seconds more to join uh, and then we'll kick off the webinar. Right, I think we will make a start. So welcome everybody to our webinar this morning uh, on genetics and protection. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know me, I'm Tim Smith and I'm Head of Protection here at Hanover in the UK. Uh, now advances in genetics is something that the industry talks about quite a lot. Uh, but it's generally seen as a threat for us. Uh, the potential asymmetry of information coming from people knowing more about their genetic makeup than we do um, potentially allows anti-selection. Uh, and this is something that's uh, had a fair amount of comment in the industry. Uh, and it's certainly a challenge for us uh, and something that we will need to address uh, and tackle head on in the future. However, we think there may also be positive potential uh, for the industry from advances in genetics. Uh, and over the last year, Hanover Re has been working with Gene Planet to investigate this potential, uh, to understand the scope of genetic testing as it stands today, uh, and possible applications for engaging with policyholders uh, and potentially improving their health as well. So what we have for you today is three short sessions um, Paul Edwards, will, who is an underwriting research and systems development manager here at Hanover Re, uh, will give an introduction to genetics uh, and its interaction with insurance. We'll then be joined by Matthias um, from Gene Planet. Uh, they are a European company specialising in preventative genetic testing, and they focus on the interactions between genetics and lifestyle and the impact that this can have on long term health. Uh, so Matthias will give some insight uh, into the capabilities of their tests uh, and the insights that users can expect uh, and the tailored advice that they receive as a result. Uh, we'll then be joined by Lisa Balboa, who is the head of Hanover E's Life and Health Digital Business Accelerator. Uh, and she focuses on innovation at a global level. And Lisa, Matthias and I will discuss the pilot that we've run uh, and what we've learned from it and some of the wider opportunities that we see for genetics in the protection market. Now, we will have time for your questions as we go through, so please do drop them as a Q&A functionality in Teams. So please drop any questions you have in there and we'll try and address them uh, during the session. So first of all, I will hand over to Paul to introduce the topic more widely. Uh, good morning, everybody. So um, just a couple of slides from me just to provide um, uh, an overview and a reminder of a few bits and pieces related to genetics and genomics before I, um, I hand over to Matthias to talk a, bit, a little bit about more about what Gene Planet do. So just a, a, just a quick reminder of some terms that when, when we're talking about this uh, particular field, um, Generally speaking, when we're talking about gene genetics or genes, we usually mean a, 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 about the interaction or the interplay of, of, of a single gene. Um, and particularly from our particular field, um, the uh, increasing discussion um, about what we mean by uh, predictive and, and diagnostic tests and that sort of thing. Um, when we generally speak about the genome or the or genomics, which is uh, the more preferred term in, in the modern sense, but we're looking about the all the, the entirety of the, uh, the the entirety of the, the genetics, all the genes that, that are within the human body, and then obviously their interaction and that sort of thing. Um, and increasingly there's the differences in, in little minute differences within the within our genome and how, how that uh, interplays with things like uh, disease manifestation and uh, interaction with things like treatment uh, 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 as, as things emerge. Um, other things that increasingly are, are, are in, in the public domain and discussion are, are all the other omics, um, proteinomics, metabolic omics and so, and so forth. Um, the list is uh, increasingly being added to uh, um, over time. 
Um, again, 99, well, we share about, around about 99.9% .9 of our genetic make makeup um, um, you, between you and me and that sort of thing. Um, the, hum the, the, the humans have around about 22,000 genes. Um, this, is, this is discovered as a result of the, the, the Human Genome Project. Um, but the, increasingly what we're interested in is, is, is obviously the differences between us all, um, the interplay between uh, specific um, uh, very small differences that, that, that can then manifest itself in what uh, uh, over, overall. Um, 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 and, and as the statistics show that um, most most of us do have uh, an, on average about three million differences in the DNA. Um, no, no uh, topic about genetics would be uh, would would, would uh, should should miss discussion about um, what what what's made up of genetics, of course, and and that's DNA itself. Um, which are obviously based made up of the of the the, the four fundamental bases here, um, and um, oh sorry, uh, 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 what I like to talk is one analogy I like to talk about is 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 effectively what we're talking about here is that if the if the human uh, lifespan uh, could be uh, attributable similar to sort of a movie or or a film or something like that. Then the, the cells within the human body could be seen as actors and actresses, but the DNA could be seen as the script. Um, but obviously, genes are not the only thing. Um, genes are one in, uh, one aspect of things that uh, uh, that, that could lead to to, to 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 disease manifestation, or the phenotype, as it's called. Um, most importantly, uh, when we're talking about genes, is the interplay with things like uh, in the environment and habits and so forth. And that's the most important thing there. Um, also, what, if we have a faulty gene uh, in comparison to other people, um, what we need to think about as well overall is, is how, how, how often the, 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 the phenotype or, or the, the manifestation of the of the faulty gene is, is then is, is manifesting itself. And then you talk about things like gene penetration and so forth. A nice uh, one particular uh, uh, um, quote that I'd, I'd like to, to use sometimes is, is this one by Francis Collins. Um, and that's that, that, uh, that your genes load the gun, but the environment pulls the trigger. So these are the, all of the, the important interactions that we need to take into consideration when we're talking about genetics. Um, the other thing to mention as well is, is can what can we use um, in in terms of uh, our, 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 our particular industry? Um, and there are a variety of different approaches related to this with our specific industry. Um, the UK sits in terms of some self-regulation. We were one of the first uh, markets, as, you, as probably many of you know, that uh, introduced uh, a genetic moratorium or the code as it's now, now referred to um, in, in the early 90s, um, which relates to how uh, how and when we can use genetic information and on what, what genetic, uh, particular genetic tests we can use. Uh, as you all are probably aware, uh, there, there is a, there is some assured limit that uh, when, when we can use genetics, and currently the only one we're permitted to use, of course, is Huntington's. But uh, across the globe, there are differences of approaches, di completely different approaches, with the majority of markets um, operating similarly to the UK. But at the far end of the scale, other uh, other uh, or, um, other legislations have taken a completely different view. For example, in Canada. Uh, which which has recently brought in a, a federal um, uh, law pro pro prohibiting the use of genetics in insurance. Uh, the code itself has been recently reviewed, and um, it's worthwhile noting that uh, uh, the ABI and uh, the uh, Department of Health and Social Care has, has just issued a call for for um, uh, for evidence uh, to the market and uh, interested parties. So um, please, please, uh, if, you, if you want to participate in that call for evidence, please uh, have a look on the ABI site as well. So what does this mean for us all before I hand over to Machaz? Um, um, well, 
uh, as uh, the 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 industry the the uh, the technology is increasingly uh, becoming uh, utilised, um, we come come to understand a little bit more and more uh, as as time time emerges. So, as Tim's alluded to, um, uh, there is, there are some issues for us in terms of uh, knowledge asymmetry that we need to be aware of. There could be some threats to um, um, some some of the product lines that we we've got. But nonetheless, we 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 at Hanover firmly believe that this this new technology is is also um, uh, an opportunity for us to to look into uh, ways and and products that we can I I innovate on and provide value to our for our for potential clients and so forth. Um, just another thing, uh, a little internal uh, a, a note um, at Hanover UK, we do have our own handwriting manual, and we've got a specific section on 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 genomics and genetics. If you were, were interested in in getting access to that, and that's me, and I'll hand over to the next speaker. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you for the nice introduction into the topic of genetics. Um, short introduction from my end. My name is Matias Petrovic. Uh, VP of Sales at Gene Planet, and uh, what we strive to do together with Hanover Re in uh, a pilot project was to actually discover in more depth, you know, the area specifically about preventative genetic testing, how this can actually also be used positively in the insurance setting, you know, because we firmly believe that genetics is not going to go, gonna go anywhere, also insurance is going to be here and stay, and let's not only talk about um, you know the the, the potential uh, pitfalls or uh, limitations, but also what are the opportunities. And to start off, um, let me also share a little bit uh, what the participants uh, at Hanover E actually experienced through a short walkthrough about the demo about our um, solution. And I'll do this basically through my own results. Um, what we do at GenePlanet is um, combining, let's say, DNA testing also with uh, current status insights because we believe that who we are today and who we're going to be in the future, like Paul already mentioned, is a combination of genetics, the predispositions which we were given at birth, and then the other thing, the habits, the environment, which we are influencing on a day-to-day -day basis. And this combination actually results in who we are today, who we're going to be in five years. So through genetics, we actually want to incentivize uh, people making positive lifestyle choices that can in turn improve their health and their well-being uh, in the long term. Now, when it comes to the DNA testing part, there's different types of DNA tests. Um, there's uh, clinical testing, there's diagnostic testing. But as I said, we focus mainly on uh, predicative, uh, preventive testing where we have two main products, My Lifestyle and My Health. And the My Lifestyle one is actually the one mostly used by our insurance partners. So we do already partner with different insurance partners for a number of years. You know, um, companies like Art, uh, Generali, uh, Unica and so on. And uh, in the My Lifestyle part, we essentially have uh, a pure focus on items which are not related to diseases. Uh, things like diet and nutrition, sports and recreation, and body and mind. Now, what we do here is actually test the individual genetic makeup for each individual. Uh, and if we go to a certain segment, let's say body and mind, we have different things related to sleep, uh, skin hydration, and so on. And we immediately see that with different colors, we identify something which is maybe not the best for the individual, something which is, let's say, more average or something which is more positive than the average. So immediately, in a simple way, we highlight the items where by making changes, we can actually make the biggest progress. Now, one of the items which we added, let's say, a couple of months ago was some items related to tanning response, sunspots and so on. And this is, let's say, my personal result which I received a couple of months ago in terms of tanning response, having an explanation or a clear simple results from a user perspective and key is also the recommendations. And like I said, you know, uh, even if we have something positive genetically, you know, the outcome will be a combination of adding 
um, the lifestyle factors next to it. And although I have a good result, I still have recommendations, you know, what are the risk factors for sunburn, uh, what, how to treat sunburns, you know, products to soothe it and so on and so on. So this is the same principle. If somebody would have a different result, also recommendations are then different. Often our clients and customers also ask us, but how is this possible? You know, how do you actually determine this? And like Paul mentioned, you know, the science of genetics is something established, something which is also growing. What we do as a company for more than 15 years is that with full transparency, we actually show the raw genetic data for the individual which was analyzed. So the specific markers on our genome, which are related to this. We also transparently show the scientific background um, about uh, the scientific study. So it's not something that only we at Gene Planet would discover, but we're actually curating all the knowledge which is out there from Harvard, uh, the University of Berlin, from China and so on, into a unique set of meta studies, replicated studies and so on. So people can transparently also check which scientists discover something in this area with multiple links directly going to this. So we have here, for example, Visconti and other on a study of 176,000 Europeans and the next one and the next one, so on. Um, this area, like we said, is key. What we do in terms of environment always have the impact. So in our tests, we only test for items which we can influence with our behavior. So we're not just saying, look, this is something genetically and you cannot do something about it, but everything we test has an environmental component and this is where we want to lead people to in terms of these recommendations. And we also then make recommendations, interesting facts and so on. Now the My Lifestyle part, like I mentioned, is something which we most use, uh, usually do with insurance partners, you know, having sports, having also the diet uh, stuff and this. And uh, together with the pilot for um, uh, Hanover Re, this is also something which we said, let's everyone in the U group use it. But then we also have a set of uh, tests, which is called My Health, uh, which is then dealing a little bit more with diseases, basically polygenic risk uh, scoring around cancer, around cardiovascular diseases and also immunity. A positive thing was that once we presented this as an option, almost all participants actually also decided to also opt in for the my health part. Um, showing also again a little bit my own results. So when it comes, let's say, to polygenic risk scoring related to cancer, there's different cancer types which we have included and the list will be growing in the future. And we see that, you know, for some items I actually have a lower risk than the average person. But for some things, I have a higher risk. So looking, let's say, at my personal colorectal uh, results, I have a risk which is, let's say, 130 percent uh, increased from the average. But then I have also additional information what this actually means in terms of a lifetime absolute risk, meaning that my uh, lifetime risk is around 13 percent, growing from the average of six. What is also important is the five year risk. Based on my current age of 44, my five year risk for the upcoming future is still at 0.3%. And from the charts and graphs, we see that this will also grow uh, in the future. Now, what we want to do is, like I said, be in the point of prevention, but also early detection. So again, for colorectal cancer, explanation that essentially, if I will have a bad lifestyle habit, this is even a higher risk factor than the actual polygenic risk score, uh, which is also here. And here, explanations, recommendations, what will either positively influence uh, my environment or negatively add onto, onto the, my risk loading. And also explanation in terms of early detection. So, for example, uh, throughout Europe, it's generally recommended to take a colorectal screening test at the age of 50. Due to my increased risk, we have shifted this and say, look, you know, it would make sense to do a first screening test uh, around the age of 44 explaining what type of screenings there are, like colonoscopy, uh, sigmodoscopy, colonography, uh, fecal-based screening tests, and so on, and additional uh, links to guidelines for patients, and so on. And this is, let's say, the genetic part, which we do, but we also want to follow up with clients on the current status. So this is why we also included in our platform, in the application, also a so-called health score calculation, which is now working without DNA data. 
what we want to do here is actually uh, understand where the person is today, what are the lifestyle factors positively or negatively influencing his, risk, his risks, and what he or she should focus on in the current moment. So this is now again my data, so I have a currently quite good health score, but it's been moving up and down in the last couple of months, you know, so it, it was at, I don't know, 800, went down to uh, 730. Um, now it recently went up again. And if I have a look at uh, the elements which are here, we have, I don't know, smoking, I never smoked, I have a good resting heart rate, sleep well, you know, in terms of steps, it's connected also to my wearable device. So I have tracking for the last three months, one year and so on. So we can actually check what are the elements. But if I go, let's say to the, and here again, you know, recommendations and stuff like this. But if I go again to what I can improve, I have a slightly higher BMI. Uh, I have too much stress. The alcohol consumption, I'm gonna you know, skip quickly. You did not see this. But another interesting thing is, let's say my LDL, which is also connected to another functionality, which was part uh, of the platform and the experience of the pilot. So we also included, let's say, a blood biomarker interpretation layer, where we actually curate all the results explain, for example, what is LDL, how does it affect health, how can we manage it, so acting like an encyclopedia, but basically also to the standard lab results, we do provide specific recommendations. Um, and this is also my personal story. Uh, you know, five years ago, my doctor told me, you know, do you want to have like a preventive uh, health check? I said, great, you know, of course I would like to do this. She sent me to the lab. I came back, she said, look, you know, you're a perfect human being, everything is great. I said, thank you, doctor, you know, really nice to hear. And then last year, you know, she told me again, go to the lab, come back. And all of a sudden, last year on the 15th of April, my cholesterol was at 4.3, which was already in a clinically relevant level that essentially slowly I would need some medication. She said, look, you know, since it's the first time, we're still gonna monitor this. And this year, she sent me back for another checkup and I managed to decrease my LDL levels down to 3.9. So this is another functionality of history tracking about the results and highlighting also this, you know, but here we want to be completely in a preventive manner as well, because if something is elevated or close to a, a clinical level, our recommendation is always, you know, go and consult with your doctor, but we still on top provide uh, recommendations, how to manage this, how to improve this, how to you know uh, do a certain element in a preventive way. And the whole aim of the platform of genetics and blood is to identify where we are in terms of our uh, differences, where we are in terms of our needs and properly manage, notify and keep people updated about this and also through their progress. Um, this would be a short demo and now I'm handing over the word back again to Tim for a follow-up discussion about some of the pilot experience. Great, thank you. Um, good, so the plan now is that we're going to have a discussion to give some insights into the pilot that we went through. So this was a pilot that involved uh, around 50 to 60 staff at Hanover Re trying out the technology, understanding what insights we could get and throughout the whole process, um, feeding back on the experience, how useful various things were, uh, and I guess as insiders in this industry, uh, how we thought it was applicable uh, to protection. Um, so, Matjash, perhaps I could uh, start with you. So, I mean, the pilot study was designed between our organisations, but we're certainly led by your expertise and experience given the work you've done with insurers in the past. Uh, perhaps you could give us some uh, insight or just make some comments about the journey that uh, Hanover East staff went on during this pilot, what was in scope uh, and, and what were the key elements? Yeah, sure thing. Uh, basically, what we wanted to do is, you know, via an internal pilot, also get two things, you know, the personal experience of participants being exposed and ex testing themselves a certain set of DNA tests. Because, you know, there is different test types out there, you know, and if I just say, you know, let's put DNA next to insurance, you know, 
50% of people will immediately get scared. 50% will get, yeah, yeah let's do it. Uh, so it, I think it's important to really have a personal experience. This was one of the aims. And the other thing was, you know, really then have industry experts look at it from an industry perspective. You know, what are the benefits? What is the potential? How could this be actually implemented in a positive way to actually create a win-win situation? You know, how can we create a win situation for the insured? How can we create a win situation also for the insurance company? And the pilot was a six month pilot uh, where we provided everyone with the My Lifestyle DNA test, like I said, on purpose, nutrition, sports, no diseases included. Uh, optional opt in for the My Health part, which is dealing with the polygenic risk scoring risk for cardiovascular and um, cancer diseases. And on top of that, we also, for the UK branch, provided some blood testing to also measure, let's say, the progress between the start of the pilot and the end of the pilot. And all the participants had access to the application. You know, we also measured, uh, you know, how they're using it, how frequently they're using it, because for us, it's also important not to do it just once, but also keep a momentum. Here, maybe just one piece of information. We are uh, from last year, basically one of the first companies in the global market using so-called whole genome sequencing technology, which allows us also to provide new insights and new results and new analysis on a constant basis when new scientific discoveries happen. And we saw that this is one of the strong engagement points where people then also return to the ecosystem, you know, to redo their um, health scores, to also look at their new results, previous results, and so on. And Lisa, you were one of the participants, and maybe you can also share your story a little bit, how you experienced the program. Yeah, happy to, Matthias. So I was, I hadn't done this sort of uh, testing together with the blood testing before. So it was that kind of combination of the genetic testing together with the blood testing that I was particularly interested to try out. So it was actually a very good experience. So Matthias uh, came to the office and launched the, the pilot and gave everyone their, their DNA kit. And it was quite simple to make the test. So it's just spitting in a in a tube. I think finding a quiet corner for that helped or people could take it home and kind of bring it back the next day. We also arranged for kits to be uh, posted to people that couldn't make it into the office or for some of the, the global colleagues that participated as well. So logistically, it was quite easy. Participants had a, a very good experience with that, similar to me. I think more than 90% found it a very easy process. So that was great. And then whilst the results were being analysed, that's when we got set up with the health score. So starting to track things like the physical activity or filling in those different measures in the circle that Matthias shared earlier. So things like the blood pressure and other scores. And then there was quite a lot of anticipation for the first results. So the first results shared were the nutrition insights. So there was yeah a lot of different information there. I think one that stood out to me was that I was likely to be lactose intolerant, which I hadn't have been aware of before. So that was particularly interesting. Uh, so I, I had the coaching session and it was very much because it's that combination of genes and environment. It's not to say I would definitely be lactose intolerant, but I decided to cut out dairy for one month. And actually by doing that, I, I felt a lot healthier. And also interestingly from the, the first blood test, I'd had a high cholesterol that came back from that first blood test. So actually by cutting out dairy, I think it brought my cholesterol back into normal lines as well by the time of that, that second blood test. So it was great to see just in the space of a couple of months, that actionable change in, in my cholesterol, just from making one small tangible change. There's a lot of different information that's out there, but really making sure to focus in on those that can have sort of the most impact for for me uh, as an individual, for, for participants, that's that's really the key. There's a lot of information. So the the coaching and the guidance or just taking the time to look through the results. Yeah, that, that was really great. So I think there's a lot to take away from that diet and nutrition chapter uh, as well. Yeah, I, I mean, I would definitely second that. So I took part in the pilot as well, as you probably would expect. Um, and certainly, um, you know, it was that coaching element that I found very useful. So having somebody explain the results to you. Um, and I think the personalized nature of the results then really comes through. So you, um, you know, obviously everybody knows certain things they could do 
you know, drink less alcohol, eat more healthily, do a bit more exercise that would probably improve their health. But, you know, if they, if you're told, actually, given your genetic makeup, if you may, you know, these are the three most valuable things that you can do. These are the small changes potentially that you could make that are going to have the biggest impact. Uh, and I think it's uh, it's that that probably has the potential here for me. So I think, you know, I guess if we think to our industry, policyholders probably don't want their insurance companies lecturing them with do this, do that, where it seems sort of very generic advice. But if they can give very specific and targeted insights, then maybe that will be uh, far more appreciated. I mean, in terms of the um, the sort of findings and, and particularly the user engagement and things, um, maybe Lisa or Matthias, you can give some insight into the sort of levels of engagement we saw. Yeah, for sure it was a higher uptake than we expected. So we wanted at least 40 participants and there was some healthy scepticism as to whether we'd uh, find 40 people within our branch of, of 70 to, to take this up. But yeah, we had more than 60 participants in the end, sort of including requests from different senior managers and in, in other offices to participate as well. So uh, Gene Planet were very accommodating to that to allow sort of experts in a few different countries to also participate. So I think it was really good. It generated a lot of discussion in the office, like the analyses, like who's a better metabolizer of alcohol or, or caffeine. That's quite a really useful insight, right? Cutting out caffeine in the afternoon. Uh, fortunately, I don't need to do that, but quite a lot of people do versus the alcohol where I'm just a bad metabolizer of alcohol. So knowing to to cut back on that, uh, that, that was great. It was very good, good engagement when those results came out. Yeah, maybe just to add a couple of words here, you know, on the engagement. So also for us, like I said, it's it's important to keep the people, you know, in the app and in the ecosystem. Uh, and during the pilot, we actually had uh, eighty three percent retention on monthly active users. And if we look also at the weekly stickiness level, it was above fifty percent, meaning that you know those clients were returning also on a weekly level. Um, I mean, we don't promise as, as a solution like a day to day high end engagement tool because we also sure believe that this is, let's say, short lived in, in many instances. But the aim is really to keep clients for a long time, identify the right things and, you know, act upon them and, you know, support the people also with reminders around this, you know, and um, Lisa, also what you mentioned, you know, what you discovered, this is also something which we frequently get from clients, you know. They say, uh, I, I always thought this is something which is uh, potentially something. I, I always this, uh, thought that this would make me problems. And once they get the results and dig a little bit deeper, you know, then they actually see that this is something which is really something they should change. And it would be great if they have also changed it uh, earlier. You know, um, one example is my wife. You know, she was tired for years, had problems, you know, with um, uh, low energy and stuff like this. And the doctor discovered eventually that she's really low on iron, you know, and that really she has to supplement, has to change several items. And once she got the DNA test, you know, it also showed a poor metabolism of iron, you know. And if she knew this, I don't know, five years ago, 10 years ago, she could have acted sooner in a specific way, as opposed to waiting and checking, you know, not even going to the doctor saying, look, I mean, I'm tired, it's normal. But then you have a certain direction which you can quicker come to a certain solution uh, of, of a potential problem. I think that combination is really valuable. There were quite a few that came up for me, like a lot of B vitamins, where I'm a poor metabolizer, but I could actually see from the blood test I, I wasn't deficient in those. So I, I took a lot of comfort in that. It's also one to keep keep a track of, right? So when I do blood tests in the future to try and see if I can also get those ones tested to make sure that it doesn't suddenly swing the, the other way, I think is is great. It really shows the value of combining sort of the genetics. It's something to look out for. And then also things like the blood testing to make sure, you know, whether or not that's been adapted through diet or already for people. Yeah. And what, what was also good, you know, that, you know, uh, on the feedback of the survey, you know, 90% actually found the recommendations useful. 50% uh, of your group actually made changes after the receiving the results. And from our other corporations, this can be as high as, I don't know, 70% uh, or 75% of participants. So this personalization aspect, which Tim, you also mentioned, you know, once you get your own results, you do look at it differently, start acting sooner. And there is also independent studies which are showing that this is like an effect that genetic testing can actually have on individual to start acting. 
And touching in on the sort of ongoing engagement, because I guess that's an area that's always a challenge um, well, in any, any industry, but uh, certainly in the protection industry, people might be engaged on day one, but that will drop off quickly. I guess one of the things that I suppose I hadn't probably fully appreciated before the pilot was the ongoing nature of the advice that you can give. So once you have your full genome sequenced. And I guess this is where not all genetic tests are born equal. So some quite high profile ones only take, uh, only look at very certain parts of the genome. But when you have full genome so sequencing, then once that data is there, it's just there, it's sitting there on a database. And as new discoveries are made, then potentially you can gain new insights without having to be retested. Um, and uh, and that was something that was obviously provided throughout the pilot and and is an ongoing service that Gene Planet do. Um, so I think that's a really valuable way of continuing to engage with people. Actually, if you're continuing to to provide genuine new insights without in a very passive way, without them having to actively do anything to get those. In terms of the insurance applicability of all of this, then maybe um, you could both comment. Obviously, Matthias, I'm, I'm aware that you've worked with insurers in the past, so maybe you could give some insight into what's been particularly um, valuable there. And, and Lisa, maybe you can comment from your experience in the pilot how you would see this maybe from a UK point of view sitting within the UK protection market. Yeah, certainly, you know, um, like I said, we've been active also in the insurance industry now for a couple of years. You know, the, the first beginnings were tough because, you know, it's hard to convince the first partner. Uh, but then once we started, you know, they actually saw that this can really be something positive as part of a offer, especially together with life, health or protection policies. Um, this is why, you know, we, we in general add the service as a value added benefit. Often we also, let's say, try to enhance the insurance story because insurance traditionally is about, you know, taking care of the person if something bad happens to them. You know, we want to bring a preventive element into the whole package and providing a, a preventive tool regardless of a claim. So this is what we do, you know, combining our services together with uh, term life, with uh, health insurance policies, with um, critical illness, also with accident, you know in order to achieve multiple things. We want, in a way, to have a positive market differentiator, which also a differentiator which acts as a sales tool. Uh, and one of the questions was whether this can influence also uh, sales in the pilot, and there was really good feedback on that. We also want to uh, enhance the touch points and the experience in terms of engagement and persistency of the portfolio. And especially also for the future here, where we want to actually work closer together with insurers and also reinsurers is further exploring the claim cost reduction aspect, because definitely, you know, improving the behavior of people in terms of lifestyle can result in claim costs in the future. And this is something which as a third pillar we had actually strive for. Yeah, and I think to me, it's that that preventative healthcare angle. I mean, the new business, the persistency is is very important. We, we did ask a question to the participants around, would it have the potential to decrease claims costs? So on a product like critical illness, 65% saw potential to decrease claims cost. And that's really coming from those health insights, uh, which we haven't spoken much about so far, but actually, despite making it optional, pretty much uh, all but one or two people did opt for those health insights. So that's things like the cancer risk. So for me, it was the skin type cancers that came up as the, the highest risk. So knowing that there's actionable steps that can be taken there, right, to to make sure that I, you know, use a higher factor suntan cream. I keep an eye on, on changes in my skin. So that's a really tangible way where you could see there could be very clear preventative steps that people could take or be supported to have the, the choice to take armed with uh, those insights in terms of what that higher cancer risk score is, or even cardiovascular risk score as well is, is part of that. So I think working through with the insurer, how could this be integrated as part of a holistic proposition? So if people get these different insights into their health, how can that be presented in a way that people can then take those actionable next steps if they want to, to help manage those risks? both on the, the health side and also the, the diet and nutrition side when it comes to chronic disease risks as well. Good. 
Thank you. So we have a question in from the chat. And just to remind everybody, there is a Q&A functionality. So if anyone has any questions they'd like to pose, uh, we've only got about five minutes left, but uh, but we'll try to address some. Um, so there was a question in the chat around whether pilot participants received any concerning information uh, that needed to be acted on immediately. Uh, and if so, um, I guess what lessons might this provide for insurers thinking about offering this to service uh, to their clients? So um, I guess I would just kick that one off by saying, actually, I've got no idea. And that, that's quite an important point here. Um, so data protection and privacy, you know, this is very sensitive medical information. Uh, and one of the challenges I think we have as an industry in implementing technology like this is reassuring policyholders that there is uh, sort of protection for them in place and, and good data protection and make, making it clear that, uh, that everything is extremely confidential. Uh, so I don't know exactly what was uh, what was discovered, but I guess you do have that potential that somebody does uh, does find something out that they're really at a very significantly elevated risk of something that they had absolutely no awareness of. Uh, Matthias, I don't know if you would like to comment on that as a sort of services and support that would be provided. Sure, and then let me, maybe let's start with the data privacy and protection issue. You know, so this is definitely a key topic. You know, and as a company, this is something which we really focus on. You know, we also have ISO twenty seven zero one in terms of a standard for this area. And one key, maybe also to highlight, you know, to the participants and listeners, we are not sharing the results with the reinsurers or insurance company. You know, so this is one aspect which Paul was mentioning about the let's call it the moratorium in the UK and you know some other countries. The whole point is not, you know, to 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 share the results for underwriting purposes, but rather, you know, to identify the people what they can change, you know, and leading to a better outcome for for all the participants in the story. Um, in in terms of the results, you know, I cannot be specific, but yeah, definitely, you know, we we saw that, you know, for several items, you know, people had follow up consultations also with our experts, you know, defining let's say additional steps. Um, but one thing to mention is also that distinction between, let's say, diagnostic testing and predictive testing. So since this was not a diagnostic test, nobody could receive like information. Yes, you already have cancer or something like this, which would be, let's say, a difficult, difficult story also to do in a digital environment like we provide. But it's rather identifying items one step ahead, you know, and we have multiple customer stories who similarly to Lisa, you know, received, let's say, a higher risk score for, you know, skin cancer and this and said, OK, yeah, since I have a higher score, let me check it, let's explore it. And they actually uh, came back to us saying, look, you know, based on this results, I actually went to my GP. I actually did some further screening and was discovered with certain illnesses at an early stage where otherwise, you know, if I would not do this at this moment, maybe I would have waited four years, five years when the situation would be totally different. So this is the whole aspect of prevention, which we try to foster, uh, you know, providing information uh, in, in due time. You know, people then, of course, can act upon it or not, but they, at least they have some additional guidance. What specifically to check for themselves, not just relying on the general information which is out there. And and you make a good point there. I suppose this is was very much focused on prevention, not diagnosis. Uh, but there have been a lot of genetic advances on the diagnostic side as well. Uh, Lisa, I don't know if you want to comment on that. Are there any opportunities you see there for insurers? Yeah, I think that's also a, a great opportunity. So it's a newer emerging field of science. So I guess we focus a lot around the preventative uh, risks for things like cancer. But also if someone is diagnosed with cancer, there could be opportunities for insurers there as well. So I know, for example, in the US, uh, there's been a, a product launch recently by Health Home where they sort of support that other end, right? So if someone's diagnosed with cancer, they can help to get that genetic test for the tumor and then guide that person through a navigation service to the right healthcare provider to get that right treatment for them or assess clinical trial eligibility. So there's great potential there across the spectrum, right? It's all about sort of linking in the preventative healthcare approach all the way through to thinking if someone is then diagnosed with something like cancer or cardiovascular disease in the future, you know, what sort of in insurance payouts could be there, what other support services could be there. So I think to really think through as an insurer, you know, how do we support preventative healthcare 
And then also, you know, what else can be done when there's sort of claims that come along and to support people, it can be a nice way to think about future product and proposition development as well. Great, thank you. So we're actually just about out of time there. So um, I think we'll wrap things up. Uh, apologies if we didn't get to your question in the chat, um, but the good news is that the white paper will be published um, that we've produced together with Gene Planet on Friday, uh, and that will no doubt answer quite a lot of your questions. Uh, I would also stress that we'd love to come and talk to you uh, about the research and the pilot. Um, and so if anybody would like a follow up session, then please do get in contact. Uh, I will just flash up our contact details on the screen now. Um, so please do get in contact uh, or get in contact with your regular uh, client relationship manager at Hanover Re, uh, and we can certainly set up a follow up. So look out for the white paper that should land this Friday into your inbox. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today and I hope you found it insightful. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye, all.